So I'm here to talk about the fog of concussion. Um, so I'm a neurosurgeon, and my DNA is severe traumatic brain injury, which is people in coma, usually car accidents, um, you know, uh, bad bicycle falls, those kinds of things where you're, you're in coma. You go to the emergency room, and uh, I'm the guy that gets called and operate and uh, try and save uh, kids who are mainly kids. Um, who have severe traumatic brain injury. And I started the Brain Trauma Foundation because um, I realized a lot of neurosurgeons and trauma centers weren't following best practice. And so the, the Brain Trauma Foundation comes up with best practice guidelines for, uh, for ambulance people, actually funded by Congress, to come up with better ways of treating people in the ambulance. What they were doing in the ambulance was not really giving enough fluids to the patients, and they were, they were worried about brain swelling, and went, they went the other way and sort of dried out the brain, there was, and, uh, and they didn't recover very well. So anyway, so fast forward 20 years, uh, the Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines have led to a 50% drop in deaths for people in coma, and mainly it's car accidents. So, uh, so if you're in an accident somewhere, and the ambulance picks you up and takes you to a trauma center, they're going to be following the Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines. Um, so, but uh, about 15 years ago, so one of the things about concussion, it's actually on the spectrum of traumatic brain injury. So the severe part is uh, coma, which I, I just spoke to you about. And then on the mild part, and they call it mild traumatic brain injuries concussion. And it's really a misnomer. We shouldn't be calling it uh, mild uh, because the people who have it, it's not mild for them. And the reason why we came up with mild was because we were treating people who had severe traumatic brain injury, they were in coma, and then the moderate ones were sleepy, and the mild ones were awake. So basically it's mild, moderate, and severe. Mild, you're awake. Uh, moderate, you're sleepy. And severe, you're in coma. So that's how we grade traumatic brain injury. And we had this group that were in a car accident, but they were awake, and they had a normal CT scan. And so what do we do with them? I said, well, we'll call them mild traumatic brain injury. And so that's where it all came from terrible term because uh, you're, you're saying that they have a brain injury and there's no radiological evidence for that. You do an MRI, you do a CT scan and they're normal. So where's the brain injury? There's a little, something a little bit weird about them. They're not acting right. They maybe have a headache. They're dizzy. They can't concentrate. They have attention and memory problems. And um, so, you know, so we called it, so a lot of people from a long time ago called it concussion, which is probably a better word for it. It's the brain gets concussed. And, um, and what I'd like to do tonight is, is really um, unpack concussion. I think the problem with concussion is turned into a label. And uh, a lot of people are very uh, anxious when they hear the word concussion. What do they think of? They think of dementia. They think that kids playing football are going to get demented when they're 40. They think about kids who have a concussion uh, or athletes uh, who get a concussion, who go on a treadmill and they have a headache and they're going to die, the brain's going to burst, they're, something horrible is going to happen. And I think, you know, we need to, to target these things and say, okay, what's the evidence for that? And I'm going to tell you the evidence is very slim to none. And, um, and that maybe we should be looking at this in a more rational way. Uh, so the talk today is going to be looking at sort of unpacking concussion. Let's not look at the label. Let's look what's inside the box. What's inside? What is concussion? What's going on? What's really going on? And I think a lot of people have been sort of looking at concussion and getting wrapped up with the anxiety of this condition that um, is a brain injury leads to dementia and, and, uh, can, and somebody can die from it. Okay, so I think that's, that's there. And I'm going to unpack all that and give you evidence to show you otherwise. Um, so actually, concussion is uh, a great model to study how we think. And I'll get to that, because what happens if somebody gets a concussion is they're not paralyzed. Let's think, let's think about what, what, what they're not. They're not paralyzed. They don't have, they can't stop hearing. They can see things. Most of your brain functions intact, but there's something it's not quite right about them. And we're going to talk about what is that quite not right. But I think what it gets down to is how we really pay attention. And that's what's disrupted in concussion. And I'll get into that. The main function that's shook up when you get a concussion is the ability to attend or focus. And when you can't focus, that's it. 
Uh, you can't focus, it's your window on the world. You're not going to interact with other people. You can't put things into memory. Uh, lots of bad things happen from that. And I think that the real function that we're going to talk about is an attention impairment. Of course, you say attention, people think of attention uh, deficit disorder. They think of attention when you're on your mobile cell phone, you cross the street, you're really paying attention. Multitasking, those things are all involved. But I think it's mainly a attention problem. So conflicts. Everyone at Stanford, I understand, has a conflict. So I'm joining the crowd. Um, turns out. Um, Everyone, I mean, I think anyone with a hypothesis has a conflict. I think human beings have conflicts when they're born, basically. So, uh, but I think conflicts need to be handled correctly. So, conflicts, uh, if you've got a conflict about something, let somebody else measure it, let somebody else analyze it, and then you can comment on it. But that's about it. So, I think, and we're actually working very hard here at Stanford, uh, working hard with the conflicts office to come up with a new way of handling conflicts rather than saying that, well, you have an interest in a company, therefore you can't do anything. Well, there's ways of handling that. So the company involved is called Sync Think, uh, which has to do with synchronizing with the outside world and then processing. Um, Stanford Brain Trauma Foundation. Um, I've got uh, a lot of contracts from the Department of Defense. And so um, I'm actually funded to uh, define concussion by the federal agencies. So we're actually coming up with an evidence-based definition for concussion. Um, actually, it's turning into a more of an unpacking concussion than defining it. Uh, we're also coming up with a new model for it. Uh, we have a big study uh, using eye tracking for diagnosing uh, the intention problem in concussion. I'll talk about that. And we just, funded, uh, we just got funded at Stanford uh, for BTEC, which is the Brain Trauma Evidence-Based Consortium that, that is looking for the best evidence for a concussion study. So we're working with uh, PAC-12 and uh, some other uh, studies to, to look at concussion in a good way. Okay, so now you know the conflicts. So here's, here's the, uh, the lineup. We're going to talk about prevalence. We're going to talk about biomechanics, how do you get a concussion. We're going to talk about the evidence-based guidelines supporting uh, concussion, new advances, and my favorite topic, the predictive brain state, which is, which is what attention is all about, and then about the ITRAC uh, national study. So. This kid uh, was one of 18 kids that die every year playing football. And so um, this plus the chronic traumatic encephalopathy are the big drivers in the public right now. Um, it's like the Amtra Amtrak train that derailed. You know, you get all, you don't, you know, you're not going to ride Amtrak for the next week and then you get back on it. So you know, it's one of those things where it drives you, makes the public very anxious, and it worries, is my kid playing football? going to die this year. And, 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 and human beings are not rational. They don't know probability. They're not good at figuring out probability. So if you have 18 kids die every year and you have 4 million people playing and all those interactions, you can see that it's a very, very, it's like getting, you know, the usual thing, getting struck by lightning inside a building. So uh, it's very rare. And the question comes, do these kids do they have a concussion and then they get hit and their brain swells and they die? Now, the number of kids that get concussions is about 4 million, so a year. And then if you look at that, it doesn't make sense because 4 million kids, are a lot of them are getting re-hit and they don't die. So probably what's happening is these kids are getting a really bad hit to the head and they're, getting, and they're swelling and maybe on their genetics and other kinds of factors that cause their death. But it's something that, you know, protective equipment, that, that helmet, for instance, that will not uh, prevent that kid from getting a brain hemorrhage. It prevents them getting a skull fracture and scalp injuries, but not from getting this rotational injury we talk about. So about 4 million a year. Um, we, we know that repeat concussions are associated with problems thinking, and that those who have a concussion are three times more likely to get another concussion. Why? Because when you get a concussion, you can't pay attention. And if you go back into playing football or driving a car or doing anything that requires attention, you are prone to get injuries. You, you're you're going to get injured. And so that's why this fact, it's not the fact that you have a concussion. The fact is you can't pay attention. You can't pay attention. You're going to get a head injury, but you're also going to get a leg injury, other injuries. It's, you're not going to be paying attention. So attention, and this is the problem. Here's another label that needs to be unpacked, is attention is the main uh, cognitive impairment after after a hit to the head. 
So this is the other scary thing, tr uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. You know, uh, NFL players donate their brains when they die, and, and they look at it, and they look brown. The brown is a certain protein building up, and they have the same, and they try to associate that with dementia and memory problems, and there's a problem with association, whether these things just happen uh, and they're not connected with the dementia. The Alzheimer's people have the same problem. They have the same brown, brown brains, and they're trying to associate. Does the brownness cause the Alzheimer's, or is it just a side effect? But anyway, uh, that said, if you look at the progression of dementia, it starts in the front part of the brain where you pay attention. The front part of the brain is responsible for intention and attention. It's part of the circuit. So we're going to talk about why the front part of the brain gets affected first. We'll talk about the bio biomechanics of that. Uh, but there is a progression. And I would say the progression is because if you can't pay attention, you're not going to be able to process information. If you can't pay attention, the rest of your brain does not get used and eventually disappears. I'm not, hey, nobody wants me. I'm going away. And that's what you see happen in dementia. When people lose their memory capabilities, ability to focus, what happens, the rest of the brain degenerates the consequence of that. So focus is the first thing that goes not only in concussions, but also in dementia. So this is, what we, this is the progression that we see here. And this is a big driver for a lot of people's anxiety is that the eight-year-old playing football is going to end up like this when they're 40. Okay? The jury's out on that. Okay, number of, and here's another thing why the public, the public's, this is how well the public's informed. Um, and we all notice, this is, occurs in the military and civilian population. If you look at the incidence of traumatic brain injury visits, these are mainly concussions. 90% of the visits to the ER are concussions, and then 10% of the really bad stuff. Um, if you look at the visits um, for, for head injury, you see that they're pretty flat here, and then suddenly they just take off like crazy around 2008. This is where all the news came out where concussions are bad, and the military had it, they had 30% of the military had concussions after, or traumatic brain injury after coming out of Afghanistan. And then the football players, the whole NFL thing came up, and suddenly, wham, big increase. And also, around this time, all the states started passing laws saying that if a kid gets a concussion playing, playing a sport, they need to be cleared by a physician before they can go back in. So a lot of this is that too. So we can see there is, this is like sort of like autism, you know, the, the increase in incidence of autism is so that when it skyrocketed when people became aware of it. So, so there's two things going on. One is there, there were a lot of concussions going on before that nobody recognized, and that came in there. But there also, there's a hyper-awareness now of concussion that probably went way over to one side. We need to sort of come back in the middle somewhere. Um, but this is a big deal. And so the emergency room here, for instance, sees a lot of concussions, and they have problems dealing with all of them. So one of the things that's happened is there's been a drop in, in uh, parents wanting their kids to play football. So there's been about a 5% drop, even in soccer, baseball, basketball. Well, behind this scene is not only the, the parents uh, worried about their kids getting a head injury, getting concussion, getting demented. The other part is all the kids are playing video games. And so there's actually a decrease in physical activity in young people in the United States, which is really bad. So there's kind of those two forces are driving a lot of kids to not exercise, basically. Um, because of this, the NFL is very concerned, um, and they're doing what they can to encourage team sports. Um, but it's, it's, a big, it's a big problem. So how is, how is concussion, how does it happen? Um, a lot of people think sort of Newtonian, the, uh, the head moves, the brain hits the inside of the skull, you get a bruise here. And that's how it works. Uh, well, if that happened, then you'd get bruises all around the brain, right? So you'd see bruises in the back of the brain, the front of the brain, side of the brain. Actually, what you see is all the bruises are in the front of the brain. They're not in the back of the brain, even though people hit in the back of their head. And the reason for that is it's not, that does, that's not how it happens. So uh, when, when I operate in people with even severe traumatic brain injury, the bruises are not on top of the brain. They're deep inside the brain, in the front of the brain. And they're mainly uh, in the front here in the temporal lobe. That's where the front part of the brain right here is where all the injuries are occurring. And why does that happen? Because this part is farthest away from the fulcrum of the neck. The neck is producing this brain whiplash. And uh, we've known that for a while. But the helmet manufacturers don't know about this somehow. I don't know. I've talked to Rydell, and you tell them about it, and they sort of 
stare at you like this and no solution comes out. So you need, <clears throat> you need some kind of helmet to prevent skull, and, uh, skull fractures and scalp injuries. But it will not prevent concussions, it will not prevent traumatic brain injury with the shearing motion of the brain. And it occurs because the neck is producing the brain whiplash. The, the neck, and actually there's a guy who has an MRI in <clears throat> St. Louis who actually uh, takes people and drops their head in the MRI, just a little bit, not too much, and uh, records their, their brain structure as it, as it hits a uh, little foam pad. And what happens, you see the front of the brain go whoop, like this. And, and what happens when the brain goes like, goes like this at a, a extreme force, extreme whiplash, is it tears blood vessels and connections between the nerves. So all the action's happening in the front. And the front is where your attention network is, and I'll get into that. Um, so that's where we should be looking. So people think of the, the brain as a liver. Like, you know, if you lose a neuron, you go, you go down by 1%. It's not the way it works. The brain is connected. I'm not going to get into neuroanatomy. There's a book here if you want to hear on, so if you want to peruse that. Uh, on, <clears throat> on, I, I'm not going to give you a five-minute lecture on how the brain works. But um, it's, it's a connected organ. And, and a lot of uh, major problems with brain function are disruption of those connections. And this brain whipping around and tearing connections in the front is a major problem. Um, but you know, sometimes you don't have to tear. You can just produce a little swelling. And most people think that when your head goes around, you get a little bit of swelling in the front, and it takes about a week, and then it goes back down. That sort of represents the normal, if you look at about 80, 90% of people recover within the first week, it goes along with that. The swelling occurs, then goes down. Then there's another group of people that take much longer to recover. Maybe there's tearing occurring of some of the nerve fibers that take longer to repair. <clears throat> so, so here this illustrates the, uh, the going around. This, this guy here is being knocked in the chest. You don't have to get knocked in the head to get a concussion. Okay, So knocked in the chest, and your, your head whips around, and you get that. And you can see this torquing movement. So. Um, there's some evidence that athletes with stronger necks have less concussions. Women have a higher instance of concussions, probably due to neck flexibility. Women can actually move their head in a different direction a lot more than men can. Of course, get older, it gets really frozen. So, but uh, women have a lot more flexibility. So women playing soccer, for instance, their, their head can move a lot faster and in more directions. And that can produce more concussions. We're actually finding that women have a higher incidence of concussions per, if you look at gender, than actually men do, if you haven't subjected the same force. This little ex experiment done at the, uh, the, the people in Boston uh, who were um, uh, involved in cr uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, what they did was they took mice and put them in a blast chamber. And one group of mice had their, I uh, feel sorry for these mice, but you know, they, had the, they had basically their heads uh, fixed so they wouldn't move. Another group, the head could move. And the group that the head moved, there was a lot of brain damage. But the group that the head didn't move, there wasn't any brain damage, even though they had the same force applied. So you can see this idea of the head moving because of the neck is producing this, this brain injury. Now, one extreme example of how this principle really works is a hands device, which is used in NASCAR racing. So what happens is the person puts a helmet on, and it's strapped to their torso, so they can only look ahead. And they've actually found that brain injuries are dramatically dropped since they've done this, before the, the, the driver could look anywhere, they hit, they hit a pylon, and their head would whip around, and Dale Earhart like, died. And that's actually after Dale Earhart's uh, death, they, they put in the hands device in NASCAR racing. And there's been, of course, the problem with this is you can't move your head, right? You're just sort of stuck like this. So you want to be able to move your head, but not move it too fast. That's, that's the key thing. So I'm actually working with um, David Camarillo at, uh, in bioengineering here at Stanford to look at some kind of uh, material that can go between the head and, and the torso that will allow you to move any way you want, but as soon as you get hit too hard, the material sort of cramps down like a seat belt, so you don't move your, the brain doesn't move. I think this will prevent dramatically the, the number of concussions and brain injury, if we have some kind of thing like this. Actually, Mercedes and some of the car manufacturers have found that when you're in a car accident and the car turns, there's a lot more brain injury and other parts of the brain injury as, it, as the car turns. So what they're having now is that they're trying to keep the car going in the same direction and slow down. Uh, so that way there's less injury. And an extreme form of that is the woodpecker. Woodpeckers don't get brain injury because they hit dead on. You know, they don't, there's been a lot of actually <laughs> interesting research on woodpeckers, why they don't pass out, because they're, really <laughs> they're really hitting hard. I think 
somebody's going to try an experiment where they move the tree suddenly and <laughs> so it happens. Anyway, that's, that's, somebody wants a plan to do that experiment. I think it would be good. Um, so, okay, let's get into what is concussion? What's really going on? So we, we were, uh, there's, 40, there's 40 definitions of concussions out there, and we were asked to, uh, since we did such a good job with a severe traumatic brain injury, could we tackle concussion, do guidelines, and come up with an evidence base? When evidence base means you're looking at the best studies, what do they say about the condition? And we went through all these studies, and we went through 5,000 studies. I think we have them here. I'll show in a minute. But we have, from all this, when this is published in neurosurgery in September, um, uh, we funded BTEC, which is here at Stanford, doing a lot of studies. But so what we came up with, and everyone accepted this. This is a big deal, because this is the corral about what concussion is. It's a change in brain function. OK, now, the question is, what's the brain function? following a force to the head. So it doesn't have to be a direct hit to the head. It can be some force that gets to the head out of the chest or whatever, else, just a movement. You can be in a car with your seat belt on and suddenly come to a stop and your head moves and there's nothing, your head doesn't hit anything and you can get a really bad traumatic brain injury. Follow, and you can pass out, but you're awake, it's identified awake individuals and here's the key part, measures of neurological and cognitive dysfunction. You do not see symptoms here, okay? This is where everyone's moving now. We're getting away from symptoms. Headaches, dizziness, uh, those kinds of things are very nonspecific. The most common problem people go to neurologists with are headaches and dizziness, okay? So there's nothing specific about concussion. And they're really not, there's not a perfect fit with, somebody has a headache, they actually have uh, attention problems. They can, they can be totally dissociated. So lots of reasons for people having headaches. They can have the neck whiplash and the neck can produce a headache. So, or they can have a migraine that their, their mother had and now they've got it. Uh, there's lots of reasons for that. But one of the main reasons is we wanted to have an objective measure. We wanted something independent of the person's complaining about something. And so, yeah, we went through 5,000 articles and we only, we only came up with eight publications and that's why uh, the military funded us here for BTEC to really try and get more evidence supporting uh, a concussion definition. So here are the four things that came out. So if you're disoriented after a hit to the head, like you don't know where you are, you feel dazed, that's probably a good indication you had a concussion. Uh, you have an impaired balance very early on, you can't maintain your balance, simple reaction times, and then you're, then you're just your memory. Just memorize these three things and tell me what they are. Those are the four things that sort of came out of this. And now the, um, well, the NC, so we're working with the NCAA and they, uh, they took this as their sort of corral definition of concussion. They've also taken this as, these are, these are parameters you have to have uh, to indicate whether you have a, uh, whether you have a concussion or not. Now, the, the, the issue is, well, uh, and one of the reasons I got into this is because I came up with eye tracking as a, as a possible diagnostic for uh, concussion. And then I was saying, well, what am I going to be measuring against? And I realized that nobody defined concussion properly, and it was a mess. And so then you go to the FDA. The FDA doesn't know what it is. And so if you come up with a diagnostic device or new therapy, I got people calling me every day with a new therapy for uh, concussion. Um, well, you don't want to go to the FDA because they don't know what it is. And so I'm actually, uh, my colleague at UCSF, Jeff Manley, uh, uh, got funded to come up with endpoints for FDA. We just had our first meeting in Washington a few months ago with the FDA uh, to tell them that, hey, we don't know what it is, and you're not going to know what it is, and so let's figure out a way that we can move forward on this, that technologies can move forward but not get, you know, X'd out because you don't know what it is. Because other companies have gone to them. Uh, there's some companies that do EEG and biomarkers, which we'll get into, and, and the FDA said, great, you want to diagnose concussion? Okay, it's a positive CT scan, which is, you don't want to go there. I mean, that means the person has to have blood in their brain before they say they have a concussion. We know most people don't have blood in their brain. Uh, well, they have blood in their brain, but not a, not a hematoma. Um, and so that was not a good thing to use. So we're educating them about that. But these things look like they're pretty prevalent. Again, we're unpacking concussion. We're not trying to put a label on it. SCAT3 is, this is a, used very often in, in sports teams. Uh, here at Stanford, they use this as baseline, and then they, it has orientation, and it has memory, has balance. It doesn't have a reaction time, but you can do a reaction times pretty easily. It does have a learning effect, so half the people that have a concussion actually do better on the test after baseline, so uh, 
So that means that what? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we don't know what it is, right? Um, and then if you look at uh, just the change that happens in their, in their uh, cognitive scores, everyone, everyone starts off really bad on day one, and then by day seven, almost 90% recover. You, only have, you have the sort of 8% uh, people have, have persistent problems in thinking. And the, those are, these are objective measures, and this is symptoms. So headaches, number one, dizziness, blurred vision, then sort of drops off from there. These are the three biggies that people complain about after a force to the head. They seem to be pretty prevalent. I mean, in the clinic, this is what I see as well. <clears throat> so, um, oh, so what do we do? Um, so one of the things is, okay, so somebody has a concussion, they come to my clinic or one of Stanford athletes, and we say, okay, we need to have brain rest because if you don't rest, you, you, know, you have this brain injury. So somebody's told them they have a brain injury. They went to the emergency room, you have a brain injury, and you have to have rest. So go into a dark room, do not look at an iPad, do not read any books. If you do, your brain will explode, okay? <laughs> I mean, that's ba base. I'm telling you, that's what people think. They think that they're, something bad is really going to happen, okay? Um, and, so, and so what happens is, uh, so you take a 16-year-old uh, kid, you put him in a room and say, uh, no sports, no social interaction, no Facebook, no da 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 And after a week, what do you got? You got a depressed, anxious kid with headaches, dizziness, nausea, and all sorts of problems that weren't there at the beginning, or they could have gone. So, this is a study done uh, in pediatrics where they did two days of rest versus five days of rest. And they, and they found that five days of rest, they recovered slower than if they had two days of rest. The next study will be coming out, zero to days of rest is better than two days of rest. So, so we all, this, this reaction of brain rest and keeping out from exercise is one that's based on a myth. There's no evidence to support it, okay? In fact, we do know that getting kids back into activity produces a faster recovery, okay? Now, at the same time, you have to know if they're paying attention. If they can't pay attention, they're not going back into sports, they're not driving a car, but they certainly can get on a treadmill and exercise. They can go out for a walk. They can talk to people. If they have a headache, that's separate. You handle it, Advil, Moj, whatever you want. You know, there's different things you can use. Obviously, you have to talk to them. Some of these kids have histories of migraines and other kinds of things you have to handle. The main problem is headaches. People come in to have headaches. And so when I tell them, and I'll show you the eye tracking, but when I do the eye tracking and they've got really good attention, I said, that's it, you can go back. If they've got poor eye tracking, they can't pay attention, then I tell them that they should be doing, be careful because they can't pay attention. I'm not going to give a list of things to do. It's obvious to them. If you can't pay attention, you don't drive fast in the freeway, and as, as the person behind you, there's a little slot there you can move into between those two cars, you should probably not do that, okay? So, uh, so a lot of things are requiring very heightened attention. You gotta be careful when your attention's, when attention's off. Anyway, so this was, and there's, there's, a, there's a systematic review of wh you know, what's the evidence supporting that rest really uh, does improve recovery, and, and, it's, and this said there's no evidence that, that increased rest uh, improves recovery. So, it, you know, where did it come from? It came from, and now we have this sort of, if you look at the athletes, they have this sort of stage back to, and, and NCAA has the same thing. You go stage one, you start, and your heart rate goes up to a certain amount for 10 minutes, and the next day you do up to 20 minutes, then 30 minutes, and then where did that come from? You know, I mean, so a lot of this stuff sort of comes out of sort of anxiety of the fact that the person has a brain injury, and that if they exercise and, and the headache gets worse, they're actually producing more brain injury. That's what everyone thinks. And nobody really says, is that true? And the answer is no. There's no evidence supporting that. So why should we do it? We're producing a bunch of kids who are you know, feeling like they have brain injury. And actually, the best, the best uh, thing that produces recovery is expectation. So if you tell a kid they have brain injury and they're not going to recover, they won't recover. Tell a person have cancer, they're going to die tomorrow. They're not going to really hit. So somebody else has cancer. Don't worry, you're going to recover. We have all this stuff going on. You can these patient populations. People re improve a lot faster when they have a positive expectation. Certainly, concussion. We can give that to them. Ninety percent plus recover. Okay, and they don't have. A, as far as I'm concerned, they don't have a brain injury if it doesn't come up on imaging. You know, if it, how do you know you have a brain injury? So. Um, that's the way I treat it. It is serious. It is a very, very serious if they can't pay attention. Okay? That's the one thing you have to know. Okay? And that's what we measure. So 
The diagnosis is going to come from establishing there's a force to the head and the change in brain function because so far the brain function changes are not specific to concussion. So these are the measures of, that you can use. Orientation is very good. Orientation, you know, ask a kid where they are in the game and all that kind of stuff. That's very good. These are neuro neuromotor analytics, which I really like. Um, eye tracking, balance, and gait. Um, EEG, MEG, these are electrical ways in the brain you can use. There's cognitive tests. And people think the more, you know, high end the test is, like functional fMRI, you know, MRI, PET scanning, and they think, oh, that should do it. And, uh, actually, they're not. They're, they're a lot of those, those tests are uh, very expensive, and they don't get at what you really want to measure in these people. So, but this is, these are brain changes, objective brain changes measures. You combine that with, uh, there's a force to the head. Uh, accelerometers will tell you. The problem with accelerometers is a lot of the technology is not really well developed yet, but eventually it will be. Uh, biomarkers I'll talk about. These are blood biomarkers that tell the brain has been injured and there's a little releases of proteins. Imaging like MRI, CT scan, so forth. So those will, those will establish, yes, there was a significant force to the head. And yes, there's a change in brain function. That's the diagnosis. This is the way the FDA is going to probably proceed in the future on this. But for right now, these are nonspecific. The changes that are occurring here don't say, oh, that's a concussion. You don't have to see a doctor. We just did this EEG, and it's specific for concussion. So, um, so accelerometers, we'll talk about that. Um, David Camarillo is doing a lot of work with uh, mouth guards. Uh, in Stanford athletes and, and measuring their acceleration. A lot of these uh, devices, this is X2, is a company in Seattle that makes accelerometers. They have one that now that's the size of a chiclet that goes behind the, does everyone know what a chiclet is? Okay. So they go behind the ear, behind the ear here and they can measure uh, the, head, the head turning. Uh, the prop, and they're good, but they're not up to snuff yet to measure uh, the full sort of six degrees of motion of the head. Uh, biomarkers, you need, you need to get some blood, and what happens is when the brain gets banged up, nerve cells can release proteins into the blood. You take a blood sample, send it out, and say, oh, look, they have some brain cells in there with well, brain proteins in there. And it, it's actually a really interesting area because you can, you can tell how much of a brain injury they had. You can tell, you can maybe prognosticate in the future, well, you, you threw off these proteins, you're not going to recover as fast as somebody else. So this is a very interesting field. A lot of big companies involved in this. You do have to take a blood sample uh, to, to do this. Um, imaging, um, MRI, uh, uh, diffusion tensor imaging. You see these, it, it, it actually tracks there's these white matter tracks. So in the, in the brain, it's gray matter and white matter. So gray matter are the neurons, and white matter are the axons, the connections that come off the neurons. So we say that gray matter is only good as the white matter that connects it. So, you know, you need the white matter. White matter is the most important. And so these little areas here are color coded where uh, red is up and down. And uh, actually, they did more color. They did this one, they made, I think it was my kid drawing on it or something. But <laughs> usually there's like three colors. This one has like four. Um, so it's just for purpose of illustration. But you can see these pathways going up and down and across. And uh, we, can, we can look at um, shearing of these axons on this. But the problem is you, you can't do it in individuals. You have to do groups of people. So it's sort of academic right now. It's not, really, it's not, for, it's not for individual clinical use right now. Hopefully, in the future, it will be. Um, so what happens to concussion? This is an area that I'm really interested in. Um, you know, what's really going on? What's the, what's, the, what's the brain change that's occurring? We do know that there's a metabolic thing. And Dave Hobbs at UCLA has done a really nice job uh, describing this, which is after a bang to the brain, you, you release all these uh, chemicals. And calcium is a big one. And it can, these things can last up to um, uh, seven days. And then blood flow changes and so on. So all this could, could possibly disrupt. Um, and, but this doesn't happen to all the brain. It's mainly in the front part of the brain. And you still have the issue of, OK, that's nice. That's, that's what's happening metabolism. But what's the brain function that's affected? That's where I'm interested in. And I would say it's predictive timing. So now we're going to get into an area that I really like. Um, and when I talk about it, everyone sort of goes blank. And it's probably because um, you haven't heard of it before. Uh, if I talk about attention, you'll know what that is. So the brain. Uh, a major function of the brain is to isolate information in time and space 
so that you can process it just in time. We have a big problem. Humans have a big problem. Their brains are big, and they take time to process information. So by the time you see something, it's like half a second later. And if you want to interact in real time with the outside world, and by the way, the outside world's not waiting for you. Okay, so if you want to interact with the outside world, you have to be, you want to be in real time, you have to predict where and when that information is. It's called a predictive brain state. And the brain requires a lot of energy to do that. It takes a tremendous amount of energy and lots of parts of the brain working at it. So, um, and, but you can, you can actually measure it with eye tracking. You also can do balance and gait, but I'm gonna focus on eye tracking and I'll show you about that. So uh, this, this is a predictive brain state. I want you to memorize it. I'm gonna test you after the lecture. <laughs> yeah, no. Okay, so this is actually something we're working on for Department of Defense, which is a, which is a dynamic model for concussion. So over here is everything that happens after you get hit to the head, all this metabolic stuff and ions and things being released. And then here is perception prediction. This is where your brain predicts events that are about to happen. And obviously they're affected by this. And then over here are all the symptoms, what happens to you. You get a headache, you, get, you, get, uh, you can't concentrate, you have problems and so on and so forth. These are all the, you get, eventually get depressed and sleep problems and so on. Uh, but just to show you we're working. People like this because they think, okay, this guy must know what he's talking about. So <laughs> I, want to have some, I want to have some calculus equations down here and then you know, get a physicist and we'll be all set. Um, okay, so what, what's happening? And Rich Ivory, so I guess the Stanford and Berkeley people are always against each other. I was, I was, uh, I was over at Berkeley yesterday and, and they, everything says Berkeley all over it and somebody was saying, Anyway, this is different. there's a lot of big battle between. But Rich Ivory is actually chairman of psychology at Berkeley. And we wrote, we wrote this article together called The Predictive Brain State. And so this is the attention network. This, this network lights up uh, whenever you're trying to pay attention to something. Now, attention is selecting things in time and space that you want to process. It's not what you're actually, I'll, I'll get to it in a minute, but you're not, there's two things going on when you're thinking about something is you isolate what you want to think about, and then you think about it, okay? When you're isolating what you want to think about, you have to synchronize with that movement. So a helicopter is moving across the sky. Your eye actually follows it and keeps it still on the fovea, okay? The fovea is a, the back part of the retina that can see things in really enormous detail. So your eye tracks it, and it lands on the fovea, so you're isolated now, that information, in time and space, then you process it. Is it a pigeon? Is it a helicopter? Is it, see, there's two things going on. So we don't, we're not aware of the attention part. Say, I look over there, I want to be, oh, I'm looking at the books, and so, you know, I can do, you do it unconsciously. Your timing is in there. Uh, so this, this circuit is the prefrontal cortex, the parietal lobe, and the cerebellum. So, okay, so what happens is, uh, this part says, I want to do something. I want, I want you to look at those books over there. Okay, the parietal lobe says, I'll tell you where it is, it's over there. And the cerebellum will tell you when it, of course, the library's not moving, but uh, if it was moving, the helicopter or something, the cerebellum will tell you when, it, when it's going to be at that place. So this is, this is space, this is time, and all of this produces, then goes into whatever you want to process. Um, so this guy, here's, this illustrates it perfectly. Um, this ball, when he sees this ball, it's actually over there. So he's gonna start swinging his racket before the ball gets there, okay? We call this the horizon of interaction. This is actually where you are right now. You're, you're always here, you're always swinging your racket before the information comes in, so you can process it just in time. If you wanna process this ball in the time that your brain really processes it, you'll be swinging it air, okay? It's, the ball will be way over there, it's a timing issue. And so you're always predicting that the ball will be there and you move your processor up to here so you can actually process it just in time. You're doing, so when I'm talking, you're listening to the words. Oops, something happened. Yeah, well, you're expecting a word, it didn't come out, right? So, <laughs> so you're, you see, you're always, if you were reactive, it would, you wouldn't be surprised, right? Because the word just come and you wouldn't be surprised. But there you, see, you saw there was a blank there and you're expecting a word. It, the cadence of my voice, the la-di-da-di-da, -di -da, you know when the next vo uh, uh, word is coming. I don't know if you remember like back in the 80s, uh, oh, maybe it was 90s, I don't know. They had, you called up your dishwasher didn't work or something, you called up uh, Whirlpool, 
and they had these uh, electronic voices on the on the uh, on the phone, and and you and you're trying to figure out. Press one if you have a problem with your dishwasher. You press one, and his voice would come out and be totally flat, and I would have to listen to it like five times to understand what what the the voice was saying because it had no cadence. There was no expectation when the next word was going to come. And so you realize, and then they, they replaced it with sort of human-like voices with cadence, and then you could follow them. So it's all about prediction. Um, so spatial and temporal prediction. We, we're doing this all the time, and this is what I think is disrupted in concussion. Now, if you look at the circuit, uh, the cerebellum timer actually connects with motor pathways. It gives the timing for, for your movements, and also gives timing for your thinking. This is a recent finding in the last 10 years. Everyone thought the cerebellum just uh, coordinates movement. But now we know it actually coordinates thinking, because thinking is actually sort of an abstract motor movement. So you can see that if you get a cut here, your timer will not be able to time your thinking or your movement. So if I have a cut here, I can actually measure movement, but I'm actually getting at your thinking at the same time, because the same, the same timer is involved. So if I measure a timing problem in your movement, you're having the same problem in your thinking. In fact, this is what neurologists do. When you come in the neurologist's office, they make you walk up and down, they look at your finger going back and forth. They're looking for a movement problem, which will signal probably that you have a thinking problem as well. Uh, so, so how do you think? Uh, you attend, you synchronize, two plus two, I'm gonna look at that. And then once you isolate that, you process it and you get four. That's why I called it sync think. So. Uh, but what happens if you don't synchronize well, what happens is you get variance. So this gets to be jittery. You get five, you get three, you get seven, you get four. It's all over the place. And this is an increase in jitter performance. So um, actually, if you look at variance in performance, you'll see that kids are, this is simple reaction time. So if you look press down and um, uh, to a stimulus, you can look at how variable, how much jitter people have. So young kids have a lot of jitter, but then it gets lower and lower and lower. So this is really low jitter. So they're very, they're very consistent performance. And they're between 20 and 30 years old. And guess what? Those are the people we hire all day long, right? So they can multitask. They can do all sorts of things. They can play the piano, talk to you, and, and listen on their phone to some, some conversation because they've got such low performance jitter. You can add things to them, and they go up a little bit. But then you take us out here. Not so good. You, know, you add something to it, you lose it. So there's a sort of U-shaped thing where some people, the, I think these people manage because they have some kind of strategy. But you can see here, young people, a lot of jitter. Uh, the 20-year-old's low, and then it sort of gets up as you get older. Uh, so this, is, this variance in performance is, is a product of not being able to synchronize properly the outside world. If you can't synchronize, you get the, the, the processor produces a variable performance, variance. Uh, so why do we use eye tracking? Eye tracking is the same network. So if you look at somebody in fMRI doing eye tracking, um, you'll see this whole circuit light up. And the damage here um, is in the eye tracking circuit. Uh, variability or jitter is a hallmark of, of traumatic brain injury. We see that in eye movement. Uh, it's a more reliable metric. If you repeat it on somebody, you get the same score as opposed to, say, a neurocognitive testing. It uh, can be done less than a minute. This actual test takes 30 seconds. It's very fast. And uh, it's actually portable. Actually, this is the uh, DK1. Uh, we're using DK2s and the, the, you know, the Oculus Rift, the VRs, and all that kind of stuff. So I'll show you that. <clears throat> so what we do So what we do is we have a dot going around a circle. Your brain's looking at a dot going around a circle. Go, hey, it's a dot going around a circle. I can predict where that dot's going to be and when that dot's going to be. Okay, so it's predictive timing. So then we have cameras looking at your eyes and say, let's see how well they can predict. So I, I actually have cameras. There are cameras built into these goggles here. And here's a desktop version. The camera's here. So you're looking at a dot going around a circle. Cameras look at your eyes. They know where your eyes are looking. And how well you follow that dot is how well you're predicting. Uh, and we measure sort of scattergram of what your eye is compared to the, to the target. Um, and so here's somebody who's normal. See, they look, their eye position is nice, follows it around. And then if we hold the target still, you see all the eye positions around the target. They're following the target really well. Here's somebody, let's go over here. Somebody has a concussion. I mean, you don't need a number on this, right? You can just tell there's a major problem here. They're just all over the place. They, they can't predict. 
they see the dot and they don't know, you know, they can't predict where it's going to be as it's moving. So their eyes are darting all over the place. They tend to sort of have this, uh, well, we can get into biology. Anyone wants to ask about what's really going on here. It's a disinhibition. They basically uh, become synchronized through inhibition. And what happens, those circuits get disrupted and uh, they become impulsive, which is what you see in their behavior, actually. And then this is, as you recover, this, this gets smaller. And I think I have a, oh, I can show you a video later. So here's, here's uh, these are reports that come out of the eye tracker. Here's a normal person, really nice eye tracking, left eye, right eye. Here's a concussion subject. You see these big jittery movements. Uh, here's a 15-year-old uh, recovering. He had one week after uh, an injury, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, three months. You see it's getting smaller. And they're actually going back into normal as they recover. These are all the, the papers you've written about this. Uh, takes 30 seconds, score comes out immediately. All the Stanford athletes are getting uh, baselined in this, and we're actually moving to this as, as a actually um, um, for the physical for the athletes, just baseline, getting that on them so that uh, we actually can tell how well they can focus. Uh, this test actually correlates with um, IQ, so that people that can focus well <laughs> obviously uh, score better. There's other tests for eye tracking. So there's this King Devic test, which is these four cards, and you and you read them, and you have a timer, and you can see how how fast you can read them. So it's an eye movement kind of test. It can be used on a sideline, um, and uh, it it's been shown to pick out concussion subjects. So that's an eye movement one. There's other company. There's a company called Neurokinetics. It's got an eye tracker too. Now that this one is uh, you can you can get this one's been around a long time for uh, measuring reading in kids. It's been around. It's available. These other ones um, are, are uh, not commercial yet. Uh, this is our iTrack advanced study. So we're funded by Department of Defense to test 10,000 people with the iTracker. And we're doing 5,000 soldiers at Fort Hood. This is them we have an RV, and they, they go in there, and all the iTrackers are there. And we, we test them. We're, we're, we've, we're about uh, done about 4,000 soldiers so far. This thing dro drives around Fort Hood. And, says, do you want to do 50 push-ups or do eye tracking? And so it's easy to, get, <laughs> easy to get people in there. We're also doing uh, Natick Army Base. Natick, we, um, we actually did a study sleep-depriving soldiers overnight, and their eye tracking went off. But it, it doesn't, doesn't look like uh, concussions, a different signal. Uh, we, have, um, school, we have 25 schools in New York. We have about um, uh, eight schools around Palo Alto, so we've got um, Menlo, Castilea, uh, some of the public schools around here, Santa Clara University, we're getting more schools. We have an RV here uh, that's parked by the Coliseum, uh, and it drives around some of the schools and tests them. Um, yeah, so this is the map of the schools that are interested in participating in this. Uh, if you know any schools that are interested in participating in this iTrack advanced study, let me know, and we can sign them up. Uh, this is a concussion center, so this is Concussion and Brain Performance Center, we have a very unique approach to patients with concussion. Uh, we have a neurologist, a neurosurgeon who sees uh, the patient. We do the eye tracking, which is unique. Uh, we also do a physical therapy evaluation for vestibular imbalance problems, which can occur separately and independently from an attention uh, problem. And we, we start them in exercise right away. And, and we've had very good results with people. And our focus is on brain performance. So that's what, that's what attention's all about. <laughs> so you have, you don't realize, but you have a, a, a moment's uh, interaction time to react to things. And so this is what, if you can't pay attention, it's going to be a problem. You're not going to hear the fish. So. Uh, OK, happy to take questions. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how do you? If you come up to a person after they've had a concussion, you have no uh, pre-injury data, mm -hmm. how do you figure out what's normal for them? Yeah, so um, you know, uh, what I showed you on the, the evidence we have is that um, if you, I'm sorry, OK. So what the question was, um, if you come across somebody, I guess my question is, what do you mean you come across? Uh, they're playing sports or something, and they come, and you're. Whatever, they come into a yeah. 
Okay, okay, you are. Well, you know, a big, a big deal is we're really, I, I think we've we got to uh, take some of the heat off the, the athletic directors or the coaches or whoever's on the sideline. They're supposed to pick out concussions. I mean, you, and I'm saying, well, how do you pick them out? I don't know. They look kind of wobbly or they don't quite look quite right or something. So that's, that's a whole different science, you know. I always ask when, I, when uh, mothers bring in their kids uh, who've fallen or something and, and they think the kid may have had a uh, concussion or traumatic brain injury, I turned to the mom and said, are they acting normally? And the mom says, yes, that is the best con you know, <laughs> concussion detector you ever have, okay? They say no, then you go to the CT scan. I mean, you know, so, so, so it's a change in the person, the people that know that person really well can de de detect very closely. So I would say the first thing is, if you know the person and they're not acting normally, they feel like they look like they're out of it or they're not responding like they normally do, then that's probably the best detector of it. So I think on the sideline, it's orientation. So if they don't know where they are, they f and mo most common thing to describe is people feel in a fog, they feel dazed. Uh, they also don't feel like themselves because part of predictive timing is when you're predicting things, who's predicting? It's a self-agency. So actually when you're predicting, that's you. And your two things come together all the time. That, that's actually a validation of self. And what happens when you don't predict properly, you get this. And somehow you don't feel the dissonance of self. You don't feel like yourself. And you get this sort of disembodied feeling where you're not yourself. So a lot of what you, what you do, the self-agency is from, from expecting things that happen when you, when you think they're going to happen. Yeah. Chemo brain and other dementias uh, cause the same symptoms. How do you tell the difference? Yeah, so that's, that's a very good. So chemo brain or somebody gets radiation or gets chemotherapy, they get kind of foggy. And so they get attention problems as well, but from a different cause. So that's why a lot of these tests are not specific. That's why I'm saying we've got to unpack concussion. What the real issue is, what is the brain function that's, that's affected? And I would say it's an it's attention, but what part of attention is it? And then you can look at different causes for that. So obviously, one big cause is sleep deprivation. I think one of the major causes of why we're getting a lot more injuries and concussions is because these kids aren't sleeping. If you, if you talk to the high school students around here, they sleep five hours a night and they expect to play a, a football game in the morning. And Stanford athletes as well, they're just really overworked. And if you don't sleep and you don't get enough REM sleep in particular, you're not going to be able to focus and you're going to get an injury. So it's just part of it. Yeah. The post-concussion syndrome, as you mentioned, comes with the dizziness and the migraine, and then you also said it's not really specific to concussion. Have you done studies where you controlled with patients who have migraine or dizziness from things other than concussion to see if it's the attention is specific? Yeah, we haven't. Actually, we haven't done. Um, I'd love to do uh, some migraine patients to see if they have the same. So we see actually a, a signature, uh, these, these darting eye movements which I could play a video for you um, if somebody, I'll play afterwards if someone wants to see it. But they're very particular darting eye movements that I only see in concussion. We did sleep deprivation soldiers. We didn't see it. We just saw them sort of fuzzy around the target. They didn't have these big darting eye movements. It'd be interesting to see what, what happens in migraine. Um, it'd be interesting to see in a lot of different conditions what happens. Because I think there, there's a very interesting biology underneath the eye tracking because you've got to synchronize with the information. There's a lot of circuits involved. So if you have damage to one circuit, what kind of effect do you get with both to another? Migraine would be very interesting. So if you know of any people who want to do migraine studies, happy to do it. What's the difference between a child's brain, adolescent's brain, and an adult brain in both the reaction to the stress mm -hmm. uh, in a rapid, rapid movement or in recovery? Yeah, so the question is somebody, what's, what's the um, vulnerability of a young brain to the injury and the, how their reaction is compared to an older brain. And I would say it's more, um, it, there's brain development going on. Obviously, it's myelination is a big deal, which is going on that doesn't really end until the early 20s. Um, that's one aspect. But I'd say a much bigger aspect of that is, is the body, neck, and head development in younger kids. So I would point to what we're seeing in women. Women have a much higher incidence of concussion because of the neck head anatomy. And I'm saying kids, they have a much bigger head compared to their body and neck. And I think there's a lot more movement going along. And so, um, uh, and all of this is sort of intuitive. Uh, no one's really, 
I mean, even, even the, the neck um, issue in terms of do athletes with stronger necks have less concussions compared? Well, I think a lot of it, I mean, I remember seeing a, a soccer player who hit, hit, a, hit a ball and got a concussion. And I said, was there anything unusual about the way that you hit the ball? And he goes, well, actually, somebody else headed the ball. And I didn't expect it to hit me next. So I think if you tense your muscles, your neck, you're not going to get as much movement. So, I, you know, there's a lot of nuances involved. Um, there is a suggestion that um, younger p kids have a different reaction to the same force, uh, just like women do. But I, I, would, I would say it's more about the size of the head compared to the torso. Yeah. Yeah. In the serum biomarker advancements, is that comparative to a baseline, or is just the presence of something upon a? Uh, they don't, no, I don't, I don't, you're not going to, usually these markers are, are not in the blood normally. And so uh, it depends which one you're looking at. There's, there's a whole, there's about 20 different biomarkers. Uh, but the brain specific one should be at, at like zero levels. So you could just, and then all, of a they're there. all of a sudden they're there. And there's different ones. And some of them hang around longer than others. So the aspect, some of them go away very quickly. So some of them you can get within, say, say three days. And then you, and so if somebody comes to you at day four or five, you won't know, but some of them hang around for much longer. They get released over a long period of time. Some of the inflammatory markers, as opposed to the neuronal or glial markers, tend to hang around longer. So I think there's going to be a profile of markers where you'll be able to uh, be able to, to like a like a C14 thing, sort of figure out when the concussion happened by taking the blood marker. Well, I mean, the person will tell you that, but generally, I, I think it's going to be very exciting in terms of um, classifying. Uh, forces to the head and looking at prognosis and so on. So be really, they just did a, so Banyan Biomarkers is one big company and they just finished a trial of 2,000 people and uh, they're still analyzing the data. It should be interesting when it comes out. Yeah. yeah. As far as uh, treatment, you talked about exercising and, and things like on the treadmill. Uh, what about if such treatment is causing symptoms to flare? Is there any studies to determine whether or not there's a difference in benefit or not? Right. So it's a, you know it's a really good question. So what happens when you get somebody back on a treadmill and they're having headaches? Do you can, do you push them through it? Do you tell them to stop? And it's it's really it's really interesting. So I'm, I'm the way I'm treating it is the headache is just a separate thing. It's supposed to be dealt with, and uh, you know if uh, anti-inflammatories, Tylenol, you know whatever don't work, then I send them to the headache clinic. You know, and then they they have their whole bunch of stuff that they handle over there. There is, there's definitely a group of people who the concussion triggers a migraine, and then they end up with migraines. And so the way I like to look at it is, um, is look at it as a, as a symptom needs to be dealt with, just like dizziness. So the vestibular balance people deal, deal with the dizziness. It can be different from what, what's happening in the attention focus. Uh, what, I, what I think happens also, I see, is that people have headaches. They haven't been exercising for a week. You put them back, and they do get they do get more of a headache when they get exercising. But as you push through it, the headaches go away. So some of it is like just not exercising. And I find that people who exercise, it seems like they tend to have less symptoms over time than people don't. It's just an individual observation. No, no backup on it. Yeah. Yeah. So the eight to ten percent of people that do not recover after that first week. Hmm. Can you talk a little bit about? Yeah, so, so the people there, so if you look at the people who don't recover, there seems to be, uh, and there's evidence to support this, that uh, having a history of depression or anxiety or previous concussions can, uh, those the, a lot of the, that group end up to be those kinds of people. And uh, what usually happens in people who have persistent symptoms, they develop post-traumatic stress disorder. If you ask them, they really have PTSD. They have a stress disorder and um, their headaches are easily triggered um, they are irritable, light noise sensitivity, and it builds up. And uh, what I try and do is get them early and get them exercising, getting them, trying to get them back into activity rather than keeping them out. I think the tendency keeping them out is that uh, they, they tend to become almost psychiatric after a, problem, after a while, and it's really a problem. And so we notice is we've tested a lot of people with uh, persistent post-concussive syndrome. So the three years, uh, three months out, most of them are about a year or two out. And there have been a lot of studies in the military as well. And a lot of them have PTSD. And when you test them neurocognitively, the, the majority actually score normally neurocognitively. But they have a lot of uh, depression, anxiety, 
those kinds of those kinds of issues. And so, um, for whatever reason, I think what happens is initially um, there is there's a concussion. They really have a problem, and there's a dissonance of self, so that you're no longer yourself. And people deal with it in different ways, and it can be it can you can produce a psychiatric problem with that, you know, because suddenly. I mean, I guess some people taking LSD or something like that, and they suddenly have this dissociation. Some people just handle it perfectly fine. They go on for the ride, and the other ones go, wait a minute, you know, what happened? That wasn't, and then, and then there's, a, there's a major res, uh, sort of response to that. So um, I think that's sort of an interesting area. I, what I've seen in my patients is that seems to be, uh, when you talk to them about early on what happened afterwards, they really had this uh, dissociation of of what they what they who they who they were and they became somebody else. I always have the scale where I say one to ten, one's yourself, ten's an alien. Uh, you know what what ha right after the accidents, what do you feel like? So I feel like an alien, and then then they gradually sort of start coming back towards themselves. And I can actually ask them on a scale of one to ten as they recover, uh, and it seems to go along a little bit with the attention. So this sort of you know coming together. And, it, and if there's all, and, and if you don't do a baseline, you don't know when they come back truly to themselves. And that's a, that's something I like. We have that's why we're doing the study of ten thousand people is to see when you come back to your baseline, and you and you and but if somebody comes back just a little bit different from that, what happens, right? So they're no longer so your high your high functioning executive, and you come back to normal, but you don't feel like yourself. You're not performing exactly the way you did, and you're very precise. That difference, what 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 does it? What's the effect on you psychologically? So then you get into what's the effect of anything that's a little bit different on anybody psychologically, right? So and, you, and then you get the response. So that's probably where you get your ten percent. Yeah. Uh, I'll take one over there. Yeah. Um, since your head really gets knocked around, is there evidence that the dizziness might also be caused by BPPB with the inner ear? Yeah, yeah. So that would, so the question was, uh, your head gets knocked around. What about your inner ear? Is this an inner ear problem? And I say definitely. So so I see people who uh, their brain gets knocked around and, and you know and their um, their attention could be just perfectly fine, but they have. You know they have problems with dizziness and balance, so that's an inner ear problem. So we separate those two. We we analyze them separately. So there's there's the attention issue, then there's the vestibular balance part. They're they're handled separate, and you can have you can have them together, you can have them separate. You know all sorts of ways. So it's very important. A lot of people have positional vertigo problems, even though they can pay attention, and that could be very disruptive. Yeah. Yeah. You're a neurosurgeon. Is there a surgical approach to the people that don't? Recover or other therapies for the people that don't get better? Yeah. Um, well, so a lot of it's uh, depression, anxiety. Actually, there's a whole um, field of neurosurgery called neuromodulation, where uh, they started off in Parkinson's, stimulating parts of the brain, and now they've gone to um, obsessive compulsive disorder and severe depression, and they've stimulated parts of the brain. They've actually had a lot of success with. People who have had severe depression, intractable depression, not responsive to medication, not responsive to uh, other things. I see some of the older guys smiling because it goes back to the 70s when you had, it was here in California with Reagan, and UCLA started a thing called the Violence Center. I was at UCLA then. They had, a, they had, uh, they had two neurosurgeons come from, from Boston, and they were doing frontal lobotomies on patients. And, and a lot of the pr California prison system, they were doing frontal lobotomies. And so there's a big movement against neurosurgical uh, treatment of, of psychiatric disorders. And so, but it's coming back now very conservatively. So these are people who don't uh, respond to anything. I mean, they, they failed medication, failed um, shock therapy, and so on. You know, people that really have. Um, Terrible depression seem to respond. So, I think stay tuned. And probably uh, Jamie Henderson is one of the neurosurgeons here. Uh, I don't know if he's giving a lecture. Uh, we had last week. We had something on deep brain stimulation. Okay. For uh, tremor, and we've had some for pain. You may want to get him because he's, he's yeah. On our yeah. Too. Yeah. He's he's uh, Jamie Henderson is really terrific. You can get him as a speaker. Address that. Yeah. Okay. I think. One, more. Uh, one more. Way back. Oh, me. <laughs> um, a lot of what you talked about um, 
so it seems to be in the context of a single event. So what, and you, I know that there's evidence that for people who have multiple concussions mm -hmm. or multiple events that there's kind of bad outcomes, but I guess, is it the, like the severity or the quantity that is more yeah. predictive of those outcomes? And like if you do have, if you're going by numbers, um, like at what numbers are sort of like a guarantee of long-term damage? Yeah, so the question is uh, people with multiple concussions, or is that a different group? Um, at what, what number would you say is too much and you should stop playing sports or quit the NFL or whatever it is you want to do? Um, I would say the problem is that we're late, we're, again, we're labeling things. You had a concussion, you had another concussion, and we don't know if people, what the recovery is. I, I would say start off with a sort of a neat hypothesis that they had a concussion, they weren't paying attention, they didn't fully recover their attention. They went back and having a worse concussion because they're really not paying attention. And then they're generally not paying attention at all and they're just getting lots and lots of concussions. And eventually their attention is going to get so bad that yes, eventually you could lead to dementia because they can't pay attention. So I think it comes down to at some point we have to say, do you want to survey people at high risk, uh, you know, even industry, uh, high risk uh, um, jobs, whether it be sports or otherwise, where you only want people who can really pay attention, otherwise they're going to injure themselves and maybe others, you know? I mean, maybe you want, you want people playing football who really can focus, who can learn, learn how to avoid injury, and when they go in, and by the way, they should be sleeping the night before so that they can pay attention, because if they go into a game and they haven't slept, they're going to get an injury, and if they're flying a plane or driving a train or whatever it is, you know, it's all, about, it's all about attention. I mean, we know you don't get a good night's sleep, you're not going to focus the next day. I mean, it's obvious. Uh, the, the question is, you know, what, if, you're, if you're doing something that can, you can get yourself into a, injured or you can injure other people, then it becomes significant. And that's where I think surveillance becomes an important part. So I think what's, what's going to happen is you're just going to see the NFL and a lot of these college sports moving into surveillance. And that, through surveillance, you're going to reduce the number of injuries as opposed to waiting for the car to go off the cliff and then deciding what to do. Okay. All right, well, thanks a lot for your attention. Yeah.